Hey guys, Chris Cohen here, and today we're gonna react to another Overwatch cinematic, and I'm super pumped because we're getting very close to be done with Overwatch 1 cinematics and reacting to Zero Hour, which you guys have been raving all about. Today we're gonna take a look at Shooting Star and this character, which he looks super cute, I'm not gonna lie, so I'm pretty, pretty excited. As always guys, let me know in the description, in the comment section below what the, your favorite part was, favorite cinematic, what we should watch next, or anything else, I go through all the comments and obviously if there is a suggestion that uh, is not yet on the massive blackboard I'm gonna put it on the blackboard so <sighs> again who is it this time of course it's Nathan my brother again yeah listen Nathan I you need a new wallet why what happened to your oh that's aggressive yeah I have my wallet with me yeah it's you know what it is, man. It's the Ritz wallet. I have been telling you to get one for like months. If you love minimalism, as well as a very cool industrial design, and you want to get rid of your leather wallet, the Ritz wallet is the best place to be. Yeah, I have like two of them. No, I'm not giving you one. Yeah, man, listen, it holds up to 12 cards, plus room for cash. It has over 30 colors. My versions that I love is the Burn Titanium, as well as Forge Carbon Editions. They have over 30,000 five-star reviews, lifetime warranty, and free worldwide shipping, so you don't have to worry about anything. You're gonna get one. Sick, well, listen then, I'm only sharing this with my brothers, so I can give you a 10% off coupon code if you use Chris Connor. Yeah, yeah, you can use it multiple times. You are welcome, Nathan. Well, I'm excited for you, man. Get one, let me know which one you got, and welcome to the Rich Wallet Club. It's a pretty cool place to be, I'm not gonna lie. Sweet, well, listen, mate. I do have to go, I have to make a video, so yeah, sick, I'll talk to you later. Awesome, bye! Oh Nathan, this kid sometimes just gets to me, I don't know. Anyways guys, with that said, let's fire up YouTube and get started on the Overwatch cinematic. Full screen, one, two, three. Welcome to another episode of Shooting Star. Ooh, futuristic. Today, we set our sights on Puza. Home of the eSports champion turned ace pilot, Diva! I'm ready to win! At just 19, she's become a national hero. Only last week, she risked her life again. Defending the city from the Kishin Omnics. She and the Mecha Squad took a few hits, but they pulled off another victory. Now, Diva That's pretty is cool. celebrating with some hard-earned glitz and glamour. <laughs> hey, Hannah, shouldn't you be out signing autographs or something? Hottest spots in the city. The finest boots and hanging out with other superstars. But life wasn't always like this for you. I wonder what glitz and glamour tastes like. Classic. Why are we on leave with the rest of the squad? I could use a little glitz and glamour in my life, you know? It's overrated, Taehyun. This, this is where the magic happens. It's like how we used to stay up late and work on your hover bike. <laughs> you mean the one you wrecked? <laughs> You're still mad about that? We won the race! Yeah, I would always be and mad you about almost that. killed yourself. <sighs> you beat the Kishin. They won't be back for months. You need a break. Oh my God. I I can't. Uh Hannah? Diva. That's a cool name. You actually. barely won last time. The enemy is out there. What Captain enemy? And getting stronger. The rest of the squad, the country, they're all counting on me. If I make a mistake and the Kishin get through us, we lose everything. Wait, is it a game or? I need to finish the test. <laughs> Stop putting it all on yourself. It's okay to ask for help. I've got this. Really? <sighs> Why does he get accents? Man, when clear. But hey, what do that Who? can't be right? It's too soon. Here we go, boys. <laughs> Oh damn.
Oh, that's it. They look like the Matrix things. A bit. Not again, Nathan. That's usually how it's done. So cute! Oh, I haven't actually broken anything. How about you guys? Oh man, this time off is great, isn't it? What's not to like? There's delicious. Oh, both like and him. Yeah. And good friends, the kind that are always there for you when you need them most. Uh, right. <laughs> A bit cheesy. As soon as I help save the city. How about getting me on the VIP list for one of those fancy restaurants you always go to? You know, I think you've been watching too many holidays. <laughs> oh, that was pretty cute, actually. Nice! Sick! As always, guys, first, we need to like the cinematic. Like mine as well. And sick, nothing else. Cute. It's pretty cool. I wonder, does he have the, I'm guessing in the games, he drives that robot thing in the game as well. So that was pretty cool. Uh, another awesome cinematic, again, not as cool as Dragons or which one was the other one? That was sick. Oh, 
it doesn't come to me now. Anyways, you guys, I'm sure you know which one I mean. Uh, pretty epic. Um, as always, guys, in part two now, we're going to jump right back in and kind of talk about filmmaking techniques used, other cool stuff that we can pull from them and take them from there. Do not forget, guys, to follow me on Instagram as well. Show me some love there. And let's get just jump right into it. Full screen in one, two, three, go again. This one comes in pretty cool. To another episode of Shooting Stars. That's pretty interesting. When you have like a tournament kind of like thing, this is a very classic way to start. It's, you start with the title, the narrator of the tournament or whatever it is, and just come right into it. It's a pretty cool way to start. To so we have a cool over shot of the city, very much futuristic neon lights going on. Cool. Today, we set our sights on Puja. Home of the eSports champion turned ace pilot, Diva! So the narrator basically, it, this is a very smart way to give uh, exposition to the audience, which is us, which is basically the narrator just explains, you know, the winning or losing of the main character and that way we get information about them, but then they transition it to be to the natural thing, which is basically being told through a screen and the character looking at the screen only last week she risked her life again defending the city from the kishinomics we have a tiny bit of like playing hide and seek when it comes to the character they would show a few parts of them whether it is their hands or a bit of the face but not the whole face while the information tells cool things or bad things that happen the mecha squad took a few hits but they pulled off another victory now, Diva is celebrating with some hard-earned glitz and glamour. Hey, Hannah, shouldn't you be out signing autographs or something? We have not seen the character yet, but that we get a bit of, you know, like, she's working on something, she's eating chips and stuff. It's pretty cute. I wonder what glitz and glamour tastes like. It's interesting because the cinematic, all, all everything cinematic wise, uh, there's usually an underlying message or point to the story. With Last Bastion, it was the whole thing. You don't have to go do what you were program programmed to do. And in here, it would be about fame and fortune and how kind of like it's not the important thing that people think it is, as well as the import the the fact that you should have very good friends that you can depend on. And it's also not bad to depend on. And this is hinted right from the get-go, where this guy is seeing all the fame and attention uh, Diva gets, and he's kind of like a bit like, I want that as well. And then... Hey, with the rest of the squad. Um, I could use a little glitz and glamour in my life, see? you know? It's overrated, Taehyun. This, this is where the magic happens. It's like how we used to stay up late and work on your hover bike. <laughs> you mean the one you wrecked? Really? Again, this whole thing is kind of like giving us the conversation. It, it does two things. One, it's giving us the relationship between the characters by them having a bit of banter between them. While at the same time, with the fact that she's a bit dirty, she's working on her thing, gives us another kind of like character element when it comes to her. You're so mad about that? We won the race. Yeah, and you almost killed yourself. <laughs> That's pretty funny. You beat the Kishin. They won't be back for months. So this is actually a cool transition to talk about when you have a conversation piece. I'm sure you guys know the classic thing by now. We have the rule of 180, basically keeping the shoulders between the two characters static and not crossing that 180 line that exists between the two shoulders. Otherwise you would confuse the audience. But Another cool thing that we've seen in uh, Honor and Glory was how you overlap the voices when you cut. And those voices, when you cut between, for example, looking at this character versus the other character, when you're overlapping their words, that when, that's when a conversation in editing makes sense because the voice and the sound of the voice is a natural connection bridge between the shots being cut. But here, it's a very interesting thing that we haven't talked about, which is when another character speaks about the character shown, but we keep the shot in the character shown instead of the one that is talking, that is because we want to 
emphasize the importance of the words and the meaning that they have to the other character that's not talking. So here, for example, we're staying on her expression while the other character talks. The reason why that happens is because we want to show to the audience what those words that the other character means to uh, this character. That's why the shot stays to the expression of the character not talking. You need a break. And we have a cool flashback. I, I, I can't. Uh, Hannah. So we can tell tell there's something up with her. She feels a lot of pressure, maybe, to you know always be there and stuff and make the win happen. Uh, in terms of like how it's shot, even though this is animation. They're keeping very close-up shots, either mid-shots where it comes to the head and kind of a bit the shoulders of both characters, or they would cut to even a tighter close-up. That is done in order to get you close up with the characters as well, and just be able to see their expression in a more detailed way. We barely won last time. The enemy is out there, adapting. Who is the enemy? Though? And getting stronger. Well, Chris, if you play the game, you the would country, know. I get They're you, all counting on me. If I make a mistake and the mm. gets... Now they cut. Did you see how they put her in the in this shot when they cut with the next one? The character is positioned more outwards in the rule of thirds if you segment the screen. There, but at the beginning, there's nothing here. But the reason why they started like this is because they wanted the other character to enter the other third of the screen. If I make a mistake and the Kishin get through us, we lose everything. I... Uh... I need to finish the tests. So cool. Stop putting it all on yourself. It's okay to ask for help. I've got this. Really. Oh, command says when you're clear. But hey, what do you... Uh, this kind of HUD displays are really interesting. I really love doing HUD effects within After Effects and we've talked about it a lot in previous episodes as well. I am working on a pack for Cyberpunk that has HUD displays, menus, uh, weapon sites, charges and things like that. So I'm very excited about it. But basically, here, it's not as much as we saw in the last episode with Sombra, but the best way to do hard elements when you're shooting something is to keep in mind um, that they should af affect the light of the scene. So basically, if this was real life, there would be nothing there, obviously. But you would put an LED light that is green, or depending on what you knew your HUD would be, to illuminate the actor in the edges. That will help a lot with when you want to compose the elements in. That can't be right. It's too soon. We have the alarm going on and the cool card. This one! Doesn't that remind you guys the squad drones, the machines from the Matrix? That were, they had those kind of like things going on and they would fly through space. That kind of, that's what it kind of reminded me of. Of course we have a very cool contrast where these machines are illuminated by red. And as we guys know from like red lightsabers and things like that, red is usually portrayed as the dark side or bad. Even their hard display. Oh, this is actually really cool. If you notice very slightly, we've actually done this effect on the channel when it came to the oh sci-fi drone HUD cinematic and the assets are free to download in the Creative Store but notice guys how they made it look as almost as if it's the eye of the machine by putting this kind of like cool distortion and kind of like veins like thing in the glass that is a really cool way to make something look sci-fi and as if it's being looked at through a machine's eyes or a sci-fi cyborg eyesight as well and the way you do this kind of cool thing that you zo you're zoomed out and then you zoom in uh, actually is really cool as well because you can either one use a 4k footage and then if you release on 1080p you would zoom in the clip itself or you will shoot one wide angle then another shot 
zoomed in and then you combine the two by zooming in and out the two shots and transition in between them. Have very cool cyborg like music going on. Music is rising up, the cool impact. So cool. Now, when it comes to the project tiles, of course, in order to do this, you would need element, uh, not element 3D. I mean, technically you could, but it would take forever and it's not gonna be the same. You would need 3D uh, programs to model, animate, and compose this kind of like clip because obviously you cannot actually shoot something like this. Now, when it comes to the weapon flares and the weapon projectiles, you could do them within After Effects. Now, in terms of 3D programs, uh, 3ds Max, Cinema 4D, uh, which one is the other one actually? There's one starting Blender. Blender? I'm not sure. Anyways, guys, basically, this usually requires a big team. We saw with Astartes that one guy can do all, but it takes so long to become, to master a program and make something look cinematic, realistic, and good in general. So if you have someone that is into 3D animation and things like that, I would try to talk with them if you want to recreate something like this. Um, but when it comes to the actual flares and things like that, it's actually really straightforward. You compose a flare, you have light cast on the elements here, as you can see, guys. And then you have the projectiles being white solids animated through space. And then, of course, sound design is key. It's so warm, by the way, I'm dying. Ooh, that was cool. Did you see, guys, the small detail they did here? When she passes through the camera, the light of her pro uh, projectors is casting those cool kind of like how to call it, like particles in the glass which doesn't make any sense but it for them to be there because technically we see something without seeing it through glass but it's a really cool element to add in general and it's just enough that it just gives a good kind of like creative flair to something I see it. Cool. When it comes to dog fights, if you guys see like whether it is a plane or something else, why whether despite the fact that we fly through space in air, so meaning there's no like camera movement, like handheld movement happening, they've introduced a slight camera shake which basically trembles the footage itself, like this. And the reason why you do this is when you have kind of like a very kind of like epic shot, shot, shot down, whether it is a fight scene, explosions, weapons going on, having a smooth kind of like camera movement does not have the same impact as if you introduce the tremble or when there is an explosion or like a cool punch, like you shake the footage itself and that translate the dynamic of the movement and what's happening to the audience way better. So if you notice here, flip trembles a bit. So. Yeah, another thing that really sells this is that they've included kind of like atmospheric elements going through, like there is a very slight transparency with like the atmosphere itself kind of like going through space and having those elements going through and through really helps fill up the space and make it feel more realistic. If you see those white things coming through. Again, we've talked about contrast of color. Uh, again, the projectiles of the bad robots are very reddish, orange toned, where the good guy is a teal, cyan, almost green-like, and the overall ambience is blue. So there is a massive contrast of color between the rob bad robots, the good one, and the atmosphere itself. <laughs> Get the 
cover and wait for reinforcements. They won't get you. He's a bit too toned up, I would say. But to be fair, the, it does come with experience. Like when you've been seeing this kind of things for a long time and you've kind of a bit, you're a bit more grown up, this kind of things tend to get to you a bit more. They give you a bit more of a cheesy feeling, like the message if it's so like obviously told to you. But if you're a bit younger, it doesn't um, affect you in the same way. You know what I mean? Like sometimes when you've been seeing a lot of things and you have experience and you're older, uh, some things tend to be more cheeky versus if you ask someone younger, they say, oh no, I thought it was great. <laughs> Finding the balance between those can be hard. Notice how the soundtrack really goes up and down depending on the scene as well. Like when you have something rising up, the soundtrack really rises up and then drops as well. And then there's a very slight beat of um, peace between the sound as it goes. And then it rises up again to show you that it's not done. So we have the last robot going in. Same kind of animation, but again, the sound design of the bad robots is so sick, man. It has that very cool, like, it almost reminds me like Crisis. If you guys played the Crisis games, it had that very cool, kind of like animatronic, dark, like, robot sound design to it, which is pretty sick. Firing everything she got, but. That sound is so cool. Struggling. I love stop this thing. That's the beat of realization. Giving a bit of time, a bit of a break between all the action to transition the character's state of progress, let's say. So now the main chick. Diva, or Hannah, uh, is realizing that she cannot do it by herself as she needs her friend's help, which is the point and the message of... I need your help. Really? The cinematic. Uh, okay. Okay, your reactor's getting unstable. Completely irrelevant. But do you guys see that wall there? You know what that reminds me of? The old mice back in the day, like we're talking 90s now, had this little ball inside it and that's what was used to like make sense of where the mouse like rolls around but at some point they kind of remove it having a massive ball to like go around is actually really funny because it kind of reminds me like the old tech but now modernized but still based on the old stuff I don't think it's cool. getting unstable, so you can't see how the light this one is casting a blue hue to the character this thing there for too long for your the whole thing weapon system yeah the reactor the cool we system. can overload it just like the hover bike what are you crazy this isn't a stupid race I know if we don't do this thousands of people will die okay another Find beat but smaller let's do it <laughs> That is really cool, actually, how that she uses her own weapons. Look at this, guys, another very, very good example of how to do gun flares, even though this is sci-fi. And this actual little gun, oh, by the way, guys, use Nerf guns, buy them, paint them on top. They make insane sci-fi gun props. But here we can see, see aims, there is the blast. Light illuminates the gun as well as the side of the face and we have the flare and once the flare is gone Which lasts for two seconds here So you have a very small flare at first and then the bigger flare and then the light is gone. That's how you do a gunshot The reason why I'm letting this cinematic play out a bit more and I'm not constantly cutting is because it's a dogfight in the air. Like, you need to do this all in 3D, basically, so it's kind of pointless to tell you guys. Yeah. I got it! The reactor is critical. Yeah. 60 seconds until it blows. That's not fast enough! We'll be in the city! 
Why is he laughing? Man? It's so cute. Uh, Trust me, Dan. See you at the finish line. Basic stick. This is my favorite shot. Okay, we actually need to talk about this one because it is just sick. So if we were to, oh my gosh! So going what frame by frame is really useful when it comes to visual effects. Just to like go through and tell what's happening because everything happened so fast. So we have a lot of particles compiling into each other and we have the main character just dropping in. And then at some point there is a massive flare. And then we have a shock wave going out and then more particles and then another shock wave and then a massive white blast. So it's almost as if we have double, like the explosion, we have like this and it's really cool. It covers her all, she switches, we have more part particles. You can definitely do this within After Effects, actually, which is really impressive. I mean, her kind of floating it and falling into space is a bit hard. You have to use green screen and, ha and somehow make her look as if she's falling. But then how would you show it like this? So think about what you can use, but you can definitely do that type of explosion. Mm. Cut to black. Again, another example, when it comes to a character being hurt, using lens blur to kind of showcase that they're in a form of disarray is always a good idea. And kind of like cutting in and out as if, you know, they come in consciousness and then they fall back down uh, is another cool way. So basically have an opening, see how it opens gradually and everything is blurred out and they use the same kind of like dirt lens flare effect. Then it's gonna close down again. Then it's gonna open in the uh, hospital, basically running through. A very classic way of doing things. The doctors, and then this is very interesting. So basically, when the character is wounded, it go it fades from black in and out to give you those moments between time. When is the final thing to kind of like wake up or show you what happened after, they cut to pure white versus cutting into black again. Very interesting. Cuts to white. And then progression of time passes. I think it's Korea. Yeah. She emerged without oh, so cute. She's, She's good. And she's still working, of course. But oh, the guy is gonna help. This time off is great, isn't it? We're See? See how, what, how different the dynamic between the two characters is compared to the beginning? There's delicious food. <laughs> what a mess, man. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good friends. The kind that are always there for you when you need them most. Uh, right. <laughs> and seeing as I help save the city, you always go to. And it's funny because now the the other guy is still really wants to like experience this kind of like glamour thing, so he's still pushing for it, which is kind of cute. You know, I think you've been watching too many. This one is kind of cool, actually, as a type of creative shot to Always choose from. Pulling back, as I've told you guys before, sometimes indicates that we're getting detached from the character and it's usually really used if something very bad happens, let's say there's a character death, they would be in the center of the frame and the camera will pull back as they scream in agony or something like this happens. Here, it's used in a good way, in the sense that we are wrapping up the story and we gradually let the two characters do their thing as we move away, but in the good sense that we're basically going away, us, we're getting detached, uh, but they are left in good hands. Let's you know, put it that way. I think you've been watching too many holidays. You've got three ones. One close-up, one out outside their factory, whatever this is, stage, and then one with the city now being day, bright day versus beginning at night. 
Very cool contract. Yeah, basically, you want to have a cool kind of like wrapping moment where you have the beginning and the end, and the end and the beginning are finishing on two different spots. So basically, one element would be the characters, one element might be the time of day or how the environment looks after the end, because at the beginning it might be post-apocalyptic, but by the time you finish, the characters, a few green nature stuff will start growing up. So basically, contrast between the characters from the beginning to the end, contrast between the environment and what happened to that, or contrast in color and things like that. And all of that kind of like helped having an arch kind of like pro progression when it comes to the overall story. Basically, you want to have the point of the story of where it began and where it ended. And those two things should be similar but different, if that makes some form of sense. Well, that was it, guys. That's it this week's episode. Next week, I think we're going to do a bit of League of Legends and then uh, finish up the remaining cinematics from Overwatch to finally get to Overwatch 2 Zero Hour. Very pumped, very excited, guys. Check the links in the description when it comes to the Rich Wallet as well as my Instagram. And of course, let me guys know what you thought in the comment section below. I'll catch you guys next time. And until then, stay awesome and creative. Okay.